In addition to the other prayer requests, I would ask just please be praying about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, there are, I've heard a number of people who say they would not doubt if there was an invasion in the next week or two. Uh, and the reason I say this in particular, uh, when we were in Lithuania, we got to know Derek and Julie Thomas. They were missionaries in Lithuania. But a few years after we had been there together, they went to Ukraine and they're in Ukraine now. I don't know if they're in there at this very moment, but they have been serving in Ukraine for several years. Um, and what many, many people don't realize about Ukraine, Ukraine has one of the strongest fundamental churches in all of Eastern Europe, and they actually send missionaries. In fact, they send more missionaries out to Eastern Europe than any other country. Okay, so there's a, there's a real strong Christian presence in, in Ukraine. And, you know, we realize, uh, talking with someone this morning, we realize, you know, yes, on one hand, you hate that this possibility of, of a Russian invasion, you hate of all the things that may go on, but God is still greater and can use that and will use that. You know, I was thinking one of, the, one of the areas in the world today in which they're seeing a huge growth in Christianity is in China, okay, where, where there is, they're doing everything they can to oppress it, uh, but God is greater. But, but we need to be praying for Ukraine, for the church in Ukraine, and um, if there are American, I know the Thomases serve there. I don't know if they're there at this time or if they have left. The, the U.S. State Department has told basically everyone, all Americans, to get out of Ukraine, They've cut their embassy staff down to just the bare minimum, just the absolute necessary. And I believe they've removed almost half of the U.S. troops uh, that were stationed in Ukraine. So it's, it's just the way it's looking right now. But anyway, uh, pray for Ukraine and, and pray for the church there, uh, that God would continue to use them uh, during this. All right, we're in Romans 6. We uh, completed Romans 5 last week, uh, laid the foundation for... Moving on, uh, one thing I love about Romans is Paul mixes and balances so well the, the theoretical, not just the theoretical, but the, but the doctrinal with the practical. And he, he talks about the theory and the doctrine and, and the, the reasons behind it, and then he applies it. And this passage, especially in Romans 6 through 8, is one of, that, one of those practical areas that we can get so much from. And so I just want to look at that now. In the first 10, first 10 verses, one of the things that Paul emphasizes is the idea of knowing. And you know, he talks about this, uh, what shall we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid? In verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. In verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead. He's emphasizing this idea of knowing, and it is the experiential type uh, of the definition, but it's an emphasis on understanding. And then because of that understanding, being able to take it and apply it. And that's where oftentimes we have the disconnect. We understand what scripture is saying, but we don't apply it. We don't live it. And that's what he wants. I, I found this quote, I, I found it to be, I, I thought it was just really succinct and to the point. Christian living depends on Christian learning. Duty is always founded on doctrine. And you know, it's, it's today there is a real emphasis, even in a lot of churches in America, that you make decisions based on emotions, that God will lead you by feelings. That is so unbiblical. You know, the heart is deceitfully wicked. But more than that, we are to do what God tells us to do, regardless of how we feel, not because of how we feel. Uh, feelings are important. God made us with feelings. They're great motivators but they're not there to help us make decisions. And so, you know, Paul is emphasizing that we understand that we know this so that we can use it in our lives. You know, one of the things about Romans and especially this passage, Romans 6 through 8, Paul isn't just giving us information so that we can have that head knowledge and so that one day if we're in Bible class and we take a quiz, we understand what it, you know, we can check yes, that means that. He's giving it to believers so they understand their lives can and should be radically changed because of this idea, because of justification, because of what Christ has done. And so it's a, it's a great emphasis in this. Satan desires to keep the Christian ignorant. Because if he can, if he can keep him ignorant, he'll keep him impotent. 
And you know, one thing that we're seeing today is if Satan can't keep you, can't keep the Christian ignorant, he tries to keep them intimidated. You know, and, and today we are seeing that more and more that, you know, you are accused of being, uh, you know, that the things are being said that aren't even, really aren't even linguistically valid, uh, this, whole t this whole idea of homophobia, okay? Just because a Christian disagrees with a ho homosexual lifestyle and calls it sin rather than calls it an alternative, they're labeled as homophobic, which, first of all, is not even linguistically true. You're not afraid of it. You know, we're not, we're not afraid of them. The fact is, we just simply disagree with that. We believe it, that God has called it a sin, and therefore it is a sin. But immediately, you're labeled as homophobic, which, and of course, as soon as that's done, what's the purpose of calling somebody that? To shut them down, to quiet them, to silence them. And so, you know, Satan seeks to use ignorance. He seeks to use intimidation. He wants to stop what God is doing in the lives of believers. If he can't stop the salvation, if they're already saved, he can't do anything about that, but he can keep them from being effective. And so that's, that's what Paul is doing here is he's, tell, he's teaching. There's no reason for that. But for you to go forth in strength, for you to go forth in, in, in courage and in faith, you've got to understand these things. And so he's presenting it. So beginning in chapter six, verses one and two, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? One of the things that Paul does in this section, and in, in Romans, but especially in this section, he tries to answer the questions that he anticipates are going to come up. In the end of, verse, in the end of chapter 5, that, has, that as sin has reigned, verse 21, unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness. Okay, so then you take that and you say, well, okay, because of sin, God's grace has reigned. Well, then the, the natural response would be, then why don't we sin more so there's more grace? You know, and, and that, and, and by the way, you say, well, that's just ridiculous. Okay, that's not that far off of what is known as Christian liberty. Because I am saved, I can do whatever I want. Okay, and, and, you know, it's like the idea, because I am, I am saved, I can sin, and it's covered. And, of course, you know, Paul is teaching, no, because you are saved, you don't have to sin anymore. It's not license to sin. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. And so Paul immediately addresses that. And what I'm going to be doing, especially in the first part of Romans, is I've done some looking into, for example, Weist's expanded translation and others, and I've put together some, some what I'm going to call literal translations, because these include more depth. You know, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Um, the literal translation of that is, what shall we say then? Shall we habitually sustain an attitude of dependence on, yieldedness to, and cordiality with the sinful nature in order that grace may abound? You know, Paul is emphasizing here the fact that you know, are, uh, if you commit a single sin, do you have this mentality? And the answer is no. He said, you know, what he's emphasizing here is we should not have an attitude that accepts sin, that yields to sin. You know, I've heard a number of Christians who have made this statement. Because of the old nature, I couldn't help it. I had to sin. Something along that line. And by the time we get done with Romans 6, we need to see, no, we don't have, that's not an excuse. Through Christ, especially through the justification that occurs, we are now free from sin and we are no longer slaves to sin and no longer bound by sin and no longer do we have to sin. And I was, as I was mentioning at the last part of last week, one of the things I hate about that message is it means now I'm responsible for all my sin. Now I don't have an excuse. I can't as, uh, was it Nip, not Nipsey Russell, Flip Wilson, Nipsey Russell, who said the devil made me do it? Flip Wilson. Okay, that was one of those. Flip Wilson. He would always say, oh, the devil made me do it. Okay, well, you know what? If you're an unbeliever, that may be true, but as a believer, we can never say that. We don't have that. We don't have that out. We don't have that excuse. It's all on us. And so that's the foundation that he's laying there. So he starts off by saying, now, wait a minute. Just because God gives grace 
because of sin does not mean we should be going on and sinning more. Uh, you know, it's interesting because that's one of the ideas that comes up. And so he's, Paul immediately identifies that. Why? Because we are dead to sin. Verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, and again, the, the literal translation of this, may such a thing never occur. How is it possible for us, such persons as we are, who have been separated once and, and once for all, from, this, from the sinful nature any longer to live in its grip. You know, I mean, we read verse 2 and we say, how are we there dead to sin, live any longer therein? We tend to go right on. That idea of being dead to sin means it is, it is done as far as any option of control. We, it is done as far as any possibility that it has on its own to be able to control us. So Paul is emphasizing through the justification we have in Christ, we now have the freedom to live apart from sin and the power to live apart from sin through Christ. Right. And not what God wants. We should we have the choice to be whatever God wants. Right. And I think that is the whole mindset of how I say that I say what I want. It's, it's, it's not really like it's, it's, it's antithetical to the to yeah, the message exactly. of the gospel. Exactly. Yeah, Phil's point is the whole message of the gospel is the idea of identifying your sin, taking it to the cross. Christ paid for that. And as we talked about last week, you know, the fact that he's able to pay for the sins of the world because it was through Adam that the sins of the world occurred. And so the idea is, as a believer, shouldn't we be hating sin? And the answer is, yes, that's exactly what Paul is saying. In fact, Paul is going a step farther. Because when, he's, when he talks about in verse 2 being dead to sin, what Paul is really saying here is not only should we be hating sin, but we should be understanding that sin should no longer have any control or effect or, or anything in our life. And therefore, we need to not just change our behavior, we need to change our way of thinking. Sin in the life of a believer is there because the believer has allowed it to be there. Now, that is a very hard truth to accept. Because like I said, it puts all the responsibility on us. And our immediate thought is, but wait a minute, I'm still struggling with the sin nature. I still, yes, we do struggle with that. That's not denying the struggle. But what Paul is emphasizing here that is so important is that the struggle we have with our sin nature, the strength of the sin nature, the, uh, the strength of the old nature that we fight against, because we are in Christ, is now less than the power of God to overcome that. And that is a powerful truth that most of us struggle with recognizing and living. Yes, I am tempted to sin. No, I am never, as a believer, I am never obligated to sin, and I am never a sinner because I couldn't help it. The power of God in us, because we are in Christ and he is in us, is greater than the power of that old nature. You know, we have got to understand that and live that. That's what Paul is saying here. So in verses two through five, he then goes on to emphasize, <laughs> excuse me, our identification with Christ and why that identification is the foundation to this truth. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul is using baptism here, and I believe he's using it in both a literal and a figurative sense. The literal sense is this idea to immerse. And one reason, we be, one reason, and there's several, but one reason we believe in baptism by immersion is because it pictures exactly what Paul is describing here, especially in verses three through five. That when we, what is the purpose of baptism? Is it, is it to provide grace? No. Is it some kind of sacrament that does something for you? No, it is identification with Christ, which is why we believe that only believers should be baptized, not babies. Babies have not been, have not, have not chosen to seek forgiveness and have not therefore identified with Christ. It is an outward testimony of something that has happened inwardly. And one of the thing, one of the reasons we believe in immersion is because as part of that identification, I am identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So baptism, the literal baptism means I am giving testimony to the fact that I am identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, it is also used, baptism is also used in a figurative sense. Okay, you say, well, what do I mean by that? 1 Corinthians 10.2 says, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, talking about how the nation of Israel was identified with Moses when they crossed the Red Sea, and the term baptism is used there. So it's also used in that sense. And so we identify with Christ, you know, I think, in both ways. And so what we are told here is we are identified with Christ, we are in Christ, Christ is in us, and he uses baptism to literally show that that's what happens at our justification. That's what happens at our salvation. Verse 3 literally says, Do you not know that all we who were placed in Christ Jesus in his death were placed? Now, what's that saying? When we're saved, we are placed in Christ. And by the way, you notice the, the tense. It's not us doing the placing. It's God doing the placing. We are placed in Christ. He is placed in us. And so we see that verse 4 reads literally, Therefore, we therefore were entombed with him through this being placed in his death, in order that in the same manner as there was raised up Christ out from among us who are also who are dead through the glory of the Father. Thus also by we by means of a new life imparted may order our behavior. We read that, we see we also, even the last part of verse four, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And when we read that, sometimes we think, okay, we should walk as a believer and we tend to give it a superficial understanding. Listen to the last part of that, that literal translation. Thus also we, by means of a new life imparted, may order our behavior we may decide how we will behave. We are to choose how we behave. We are to live that. One of the testimonies of a changed heart is changed behavior. Now, can people fake it? Sure, but it doesn't last. But the fact is, one of the testimonies of the work that has gone on in us is the way that we live. So Paul is making is saying, because we are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, because we are in him and he is in us, we now have the ability through the power of Christ, not of our own ability. If we try to do it on our own, we're going to fall flat on our face. But through the power of Christ, we now have the ability, as it says, to order our behavior, to choose our behavior. And that power is never gone. We may not avail of ourselves of it, but that power is always available. It's kind of like the guy shows up on the, on the um, construction site and he sees a guy with a power saw and he sees him doing this with the power saw. And he's like, what in the world are you doing? 
he said, well, I I've been working on how figuring out how to use this, and this is the only way I can figure out how to saw. You know, and the guy says, well, that's because you don't have the power. Plug it in. All of a sudden, it's working. When we look at our lives and we see times when we fail and we look at our lives and we see times when we yield to sin, why is that? It's because we're doing this. We're trying to do it in our own power. We're not availing ourselves of the power of Christ who will enable us to, who will, who will enable us to overcome that sin and not have to. We can order our behavior. We can choose to do that which is right. And so we've been identified in this way. Uh, and so it's so important for us to recognize this is all part of salvation and especially founded in the, the justification that is presented to us. And so we see in verses two through five, we are identified with Christ and therefore in his death, burial, and resurrection. If that is the case, then what should our mindset be? Do we look at sin as something that's inevitable for all of us, even believers? Or do we look at sin as sin has been defeated, therefore now it need not occur in my life? And this is Paul laying this foundation and applying this. Um, it's interesting, this, this example, especially in, in, in verse 5, it being planted together in the likeness of his death, we also in the likeness of his resurrection. It's interesting because a great example of this is, is Lazarus in John chapter 11. When Christ arrived there, Lazarus had been dead four days. So there was no question about his death. You know, the fact is he had died. And, you know, Christ called him forth, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, I've heard some people say if Christ had not used the word Lazarus, that included his name and just simply said, come forth, that everyone in that tomb would have come forth. Uh, probably so. Uh, but anyway, he called out, Lazarus, come forth. Christ raised him from the dead. Okay, but what happened when he appeared at the door? Now, I know this is a picture, but I, I think it's a great illustration. He was still wrapped in the grave clothes. And what, was he to, what were they told to do? Loose him and let him go. He was not to be bound any longer. He had been raised in newness of life. Now, it's an illustration. I understand that. But it's a great picture. We were dead in sin. And because Christ, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and, and our receiving of the free gift, we have been given a new life. We are now to walk in that life. But how many of us are trying to walk in that life still wrapped by the grave clothes of sin? Still wrapped in that because we have not understood that not only are we free from that, you know, are we freed from that death, that eternal separation, but we are freed from sin having control over our lives. And we still walk with the grave clothes wrapped around us or try, you know, or we take some of them off, but we leave others. And our service for God and our life is hindered because we have not understood that truth, that we are free from sin. You may say, well, wait a minute, free from sin. That's, that's a pretty strong statement. Verse six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, Paul is using the picture here very clearly of the fact that dead men don't respond. You know, and to, you know, and so if you're dead, you are not controlled by anything. So if we are dead to sin, we are not to be controlled by that sin. I love verses 6 and 7, literally. So I want to I read this. Knowing this experientially, not, when we say knowing this, it's not just our head knowledge. We should be living this. It should be known experientially. That our old unregenerate self was crucified for all with him, with Christ, in order that the physical body heretofore dominated by the sinful nature might be rendered inoperative. And that inoperative is not referring that the physical body would be rendered inoperative, although the older we get, the more it feels that way. 
but it's referring to that sinful nature being rendered inoperative. With the result that no longer are we rendering a slave's habitual obedience to the sinful nature, for the one who died once for all stands in the position of a permanent relationship of freedom from the sinful nature. That's powerful. But you know, there's a word in there, or there's a, there's a word in there that is so important for us to understand, and that is habitual. It was interesting, we were talking about something this morning, it was lighthearted, but one of the comments was, well, we're creatures of habit. And we are. God has given us habits. Habits are not good or bad in and of themselves. It's what the habit is. You know, people think, oh, well, you know, you, habits are bad. Well, yeah, I mean, if your habit is you've learned to sin and, and you're habitually sinning, that's a bad habit. You develop the habit of getting up in the morning and spending time with God, that's a good habit. Think about how hard it would be to go through life without any habits. Okay, simple example. What happened, think back whenever, when you first learned how to drive a car, okay? Especially if the car you drove was a stick, okay? I learned on an old Forest Service truck that my dad bought for like $100, okay? And it had a stick. And I mean, the right foot does this, the left foot does this, the right hand does this, the left hand does this. And now, wait a minute, I'm supposed to do this and this and don't know when I do this, I don't do this. That is not easy. Drive for a few years. Now, not only are you shifting and everything else, you're on the phone, you're eating a sandwich, and you're still going down the road. You laugh. I've seen some of you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not putting on makeup. Don't. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, man, rumors get started like that. Okay. Now, the idea is we've gotten into the habit of knowing how to drive. We've learned it so it becomes a habit. And now we can start to take on other things. Habits then in and of themselves are not bad. But before we were believers, before we were saved, we were in the habitual obedience to sin. I, I love the way that it's described. We are no longer rendering a slave's habitual obedience to the sinful nature. We were slaves to sin, and we developed sinful habits. Those habits do not necessarily go away at the moment of salvation. They can. I have read the testimonies of some who were alcoholics before salvation, and, and at salvation they said, I didn't desire another drink. God miraculously took that away. So I'm not in any way limiting the power of God, but in many cases those habits stay, and part of the process of sanctification, what does Paul tell us to do? Working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, working out that sanctification, going through the process. I believe one of the reasons God leaves those many times habits in our lives is so that we will go through the process of getting rid of them and grow as we go through the process. There are some that God takes away because those habits hinder the testimony or, or give opportunity for testimony, the removal of those. But in many cases, when we have that, those habits and we have to overcome those habits and build new habits, we grow through that. So God knows, okay, that's in his hands. Leave it with him. But the fact is, as sinners, we develop habits. We develop ways of thinking. As believers, we've got to deal, build new habits. And this is, this is identified over and over. I think one of the classic passage on, passages on this is, is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Putting aside the old man, renewing your mind, and taking on the new man. And he was writing to believers. It's this idea of getting rid of the old habits, understanding what God says we should be doing, and then applying that and doing that in our lives. And so Paul here is emphasizing that as those who are dead, do we consider ourselves dead to sin? You know, if you ask most Christians, are you dead to sin? They're going to be, oh, no, no, I still have the old nature. Sin still has that part. Well, then we're in disagreement with Paul because he's very clear. You're dead. If you're, if you're in Christ, you're dead to sin. Now, unfortunately, we invite it back at times. Unfortunately, we allow it back in. But we no longer, that sin no longer it should have that and does have that control 
unless we yield to it. And, he, and later on in, in chapter 6, he's going to talk directly about that. And so Paul is laying this foundation because beginning in verse 14, he's going to talk about, they're actually probably starting in verse, verse 12. He's going to be talking about the fact that as believers, we have a choice. We have a choice what we do. We have a choice how we behave. We have a choice whom we serve. But he's laying that foundation now. So isn't it interesting how Paul has built this? In chapter 5, he talks about justification. And he especially shows that because God identifies all of mankind with Adam, in, in Adam all die, and in Christ all can be made alive. That identification showing we have access to salvation. We have access to the changed life. We have access to justification. Now in verse 6, he's saying, and now that you realize you have that, this is what it should be doing in your life. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a significant change in the way that we think. Uh, I found this quote, and, and I find it to be, I found it very interesting. It was, um, I forget where I got this from. I should have noted it. I'll try to find it. Too many Christians are betweeners. They live between Egypt and Canaan, saved but never satisfied. Or they live between Good Friday and Easter believing in the cross, but not to entering into the power and glory of the resurrection. If you ask somebody, or I mean, if, I ask, if I was to ask, what is the greatest demonstration of power that we have in Scripture? Many, if not most, would say resurrection. Bringing life from death. Okay, and in, and in many ways, you could also say creation, bringing life from nothing. Either one. But resurrection bringing life paul is telling us here that through the death burial and resurrection of christ that we are in christ and he is in us we now have access to that power we have access to resurrection power there's no excuse for sin reigning in our mortal body Coming at, you're jumping ahead to chapter seven, huh? <laughs> okay, no, we can handle that because that's a great question. Paul himself said, I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. Why? We have access to the resurrection power, but we don't always avail ourselves of it. It's like the guy who's using the power saw like this. It's there available, but if we don't access it, we're going to be doing it our own strength then we do fail. Right. Because being dead to sin, the idea there is it, it no longer has any control over us. It no longer has control over us. Dead means, as in the idea of control. Dead means no longer can sin tell us what to do. It's, for example... If somebody falls down dead and it falls down dead in the aisle and I yell at them and yell at them and yell at them, they're not going to do anything. No matter what I do, no matter how much I say, no matter how much I try to get them to do something, I can yell intimidation, I can yell threats, I can whatever, they're not doing anything. They're dead to that. Sin, we are to be dead to sin in the sense that sin no longer can control us. Sin can no longer tell us what to do. Sin no longer has any power over us but we can still invite sin into our life. And that's, I believe, where Paul says, I do what I don't want to do. I don't do what I want to do. He's talking about the struggle he goes through. Because you say, okay, why then do we sin? Because we're not perfect. Because there are times when we choose wrongly, when we choose to yield to sin, that we still allow that in. It's a continual battle but we are no longer controlled by it. We are dead to it in the sense that it has no control for us. Well, that would also be true. The question is for those on, are we dead to sin because it, all, because it has no judgment over us? That would be true in one sense. Uh, uh, sin doesn't judge us. 
Okay, God judges us because of our sin. You know, if we're not saved. Right. That is true. Uh, no, another idea of, the, of being dead to sin is that sin no longer has any control over us or, or our future because we are not going to be standing before the great white throne being judged. We will be with God forever in heaven. So it, it, it loses its judicial power in a sense or its judicial condemnation uh, of that. It, it is no longer something that God will judge us by. So yes, that is true. So that is another sense of that, uh, of, that of us being dead to sin. That is absolute. Right. Exactly. And that's the beauty of, of Romans chapter 5. That in justification, our justification is permanent. Okay, we can't lose our salvation. We can't go back in under the authority, uh, under sin under the control of sin, we can allow sin in our life, okay? And the idea there is, you know, once, once we are dead to sin, it cannot ever come back and we become alive anymore, where, where, where sin becomes alive, where, where we become alive to sin, where it's under, we're under its control. That never happens. We never can lose our salvation. We never lose that justification because the righteousness of, of Christ is placed upon us, and that's permanent. Jerry was saying that's permanent. Right, right. It's, it's the idea, the idea is we no longer are under its control. That being dead to it, the idea is it no longer has any control over us. Okay, but the fact is we can still invite sin into our life and we do that on a regular basis, unfortunately. Okay, and that's what Paul was talking about, I believe, in, cha in chapter seven as well. With, with that idea. There are times when he struggles because he doesn't avail himself of the, of the complete and full power of the resurrection. He does yield to his own desires. That is true. That is very true. It's interesting because taking that approach, yeah, the, the, the statement was, it's a lot like adoption. Once God adopts you, he never unadopts you. He never removes you from the family, but we may behave like we're not part of the family. I mean, the prodigal son is a great example of that, okay? The prodigal son never stopped being the son of his father, but he certainly stopped acting like the son of his father. And, you know, and, and so we are called through adoption, through justification, through the righteousness of Christ being placed upon us. We are being told now we are called to a new life newness of life, a new life. And that new life is not just a new relationship with God, but it's a new way of living. I think that's one of the things I really like about the idea of this idea we are called to newness of life. Okay, at the end of verse four. It's a new life. It's a new way of thinking. The struggle we have is that we bring in our, a lot of times we bring in a lot of our old way of thinking into the new life. And there's conflict. Okay, and there's conflict there. Okay, this is, a, this is a tremendous passage. I want to take the time to go through this, but I can't take any more time today. So therefore, we're going to pray and close, and we'll continue in chapter six next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. And we see that love working in the way that Christ went to his death for us. He, his death, burial, and resurrection made available to us resurrection power in our lives. Lord, help us to understand this idea that once we are in you, we no, sin no longer has any control over us. We are to be dead to sin 
in that there is no control of sin. Lord, help us to realize that this is not, this is not a one-time issue, though. This is something we deal with every day as we are to be walking in a new life. We are to be creating new habits. And we are to be demonstrating this resurrection power in the choices that we make in the way we live. Help strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen our faith that we would understand that you have made this resurrection power available to us. Help us, Lord, to avoid this mindset that says we must sin. But help us to understand that through you, there is now no need to sin. There is no obligation to sin. And Lord, as we continue through this passage in this section, help us to make this a part of our life that we would live for you. We pray these things in Christ's name who made this possible for us. Amen.